from another big island, Maui, where we spend, my wife and I spend 11 years. Three here, that's almost, almost 16 years, Mr. President. It's been a joy. It's been a joy to have served this beautiful field under the leadership of men like uh, Pastor Ralph Watts. During the time that we were in Maui, I saw this lady doing such a wonderful job with the piano and her singing. I went and approached her. I said, uh, her name is Twinkle, by the way. A little star. Her mother named her Twinkle because of a star and a song that was going on in the air. I says, Twinkle, do you think we can ever have a choir? She looked at me, and uh, I don't know what she was thinking, but uh, it went from that day on something that she saw fit for the church. And we had the best choir. Sorry, Mr. President, in the whole conference with her son leading out. And then he moved, and then she, the mother came in and did likewise concerts, Christmas concerts, Easter concerts, special music. And when I said goodbye to Maui, like what I'm doing today, folks, with a sad heart, they played for us, and they sang for me, for my wife and I. And it's a joy for her to have come from Maui, representing that beautiful church over there that we also renovated. Thank you for being with us today, Twinkle. We love you. The title of the song is called, Teach Me, Lord. Mm. And... Uh, your church is beautiful. It has been, I've, I've seen it before it was transformed like this. And uh, they did the same for our church. And uh, it's by the grace of God. But both Judith and Pastor has uh, taught me and my family so much. And it's been an honor uh, to know them and they will really be missed. So I bring you much aloha from Maui, Pastor and, and, and Judith.
teach me to do your Church, it is a, uh, it's without question just a, another honor and blessing for me to be here on this, uh, on this Sabbath. And I, I, I want to say, Twinkle, that when I was sitting here during Sabbath school and all of a sudden I saw you walk by and sit in the same row with me, I thought, my goodness, how, how fortunate and blessed to be able to have you here as, uh, as well. You know, for Sharon and myself, we have had the privilege of serving here in Hawaii now for, uh, for 16 years. And so now for 16 years, we have been blessed by the musical gift of Twinkle uh, as we have had the chance to worship at the uh, Kahului Church. And speaking of the Kahului Church, that's really where originally we had the opportunity of first getting most acquainted with Pastor Juan and Judith as they were serving at that church for, uh, you know, for 11 years. But... It is, it, it just seems like I was here just a few weeks ago, and I guess it's true, I was here for just a, uh, a few weeks ago for the beautiful, beautiful uh, rededication of this, of this church. But I need to tell you something. So look, it, it was impressive when I was here last time, just a few weeks ago, just to see the transformation. But it occurred to me when I was sitting out here during the lesson study, which, by the way, was a beautiful lesson study. I just really appreciated it. Was that when I was here a few weeks ago, I was on the platform during Sabbath school. I was on the platform during church. So I never had a chance to sit out there and see the beautiful stained glass. It's absolutely beautiful. And to look out the windows. And I don't think, I don't think the sign was out there a few weeks ago, was it? So I noticed that when I came in, and uh, I've already had a chance to take a, a couple of quick pictures. But you need to know that my heart is just so full from what we have already experienced here uh, this Sabbath. The music and the testimonies have just been so, so touching. And it is a bit unusual for me to come back to a church so quickly. We, as president of the conference, we have like 33 churches on six islands, and so every week, I'm trying to be out in a different church just to spread it around and go around. And so I need you to keep it a secret that I've come back. It's, it's starting to look like a habit that I'm coming back to the big island, to Honoka'a. So please don't post this on social media. You know, the president was here. Just kind of let's just keep it to ourselves because <clears throat> I don't want to get in trouble with, uh, with any of the other churches. But it is such a blessing. <clears throat> you know, it is true that just over three years ago, I, I called up Pastor Juan and Judith, and I said, hey, listen, I, I just really need some help here in this district. Would you be willing to come for, look, can you give, because they were retired. I'd been there at the Kahului Church, and before they left Kahului, I had done everything that I could think of to try to get them to stay even to the point of bribing them. Just, I mean, I, I, was, I was willing to lose every trick in the book. They said, no, 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 it's time for us to leave. We're going to retire. And uh, so some time went by, and then we had needs here on the Big Island. So I thought, look, I have nothing to lose. I'm just going to call them. And I said, look, if all you can do is just give six weeks, just come for six weeks, I'd just be, I'd just be indebted, just six weeks. Well, as you now know, that's six weeks. Even Pastor Juan was reminding me before we walked out. He said, you know, you asked me just for six weeks. It's been three years now. And then I did need to remind him that biblically, prophetically, one day equals a year. <laughs> so he actually has a long ways to go. I mean, you really, you really shouldn't be even thinking about leaving. It's just six weeks prophetically is years from now. I'm telling you. So... <laughs> So you need to know that for Sharon and myself that these two people have just so deeply impacted our lives personally 
And then I have seen what their lives and ministry have meant, have meant to the churches that they have been to. And they're just going to be deeply meant by, missed by us. And to a very large extent, we have viewed Pastor Juan and Judith as mentors to us, especially when we first came here to Hawaii as, uh, as, as president. And we just have such deep admiration and respect. You know, you probably don't know this because Juan and Judith are just two of the most humble people that I know. They, they don't talk about themselves, where they've been, how they've served, the significance of their life in their ministry. But because I am here as president, I can say what I want. <laughs> and they can't stop me. <laughs> Even with that rod and staff, he can't <laughs> stop me. So you need to understand a little bit about these two. So Juan has served the Seventh-day Adventist Church through all these years. He has served as a pastor, as a conference department director, as a conference secretary, as a conference president. These are some of the roles and the responsibilities that Pastor Juan has had. And I tell you what, there are so many gifts, talents, skills, and abilities that Pastor Juan has that I admire and respect, and actually I wish I had them as well. And I jotted a few of these down, and I'm going to share them with you. This is what I see and have observed in Pastor Juan. He is a scholar, a teacher, a preacher. He's a theologian, a statesman, a mentor. He is visionary. He's a builder. He is a leader. He is a Bible student, and he is an amazing chef. <laughs> an amazing chef. The man can cook, I'm telling you, and you know this. He can cook. But Pastor Juan has the heart. He really has the heart of an evangelist. And one of the things that I just so deeply appreciate about him, he just has a passion for people to know Jesus to know Jesus and just to be ready for the second coming. And I think the one thing that really defines Pastor Juan and Judith the most is the word Christian. It's the word Christian. The life and legacy of Pastor Juan and Judith will linger in these islands in our hearts for many, many years. And we're going to love and respect them for many, many reasons. But I'm not going to just say a few things about Pastor Juan here today because I'm going to also say a few things about Judith. <laughs> because Pastor Juan would not be who he is today <laughs> if it wasn't for Judith. Let me just be clear. I taught her how to make the flowers. Okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So Judith, a, a pastor's wife, a mother, a grandmother, church leader, shepherdess to the flock, one who has worked tirelessly side by side with Juan in ministry. And I will also acknowledge, you know, it was, it was all those years that we would attend the Kahului Church. And I mean, everywhere I looked, there was flowers. There was flowers in the entryway, flowers in front of the pulpit, flowers at the potluck. And this was all Judith. It was really just Judith. I mean, just her love. She Look, she loves color. You need to understand this. She loves beautiful things. She loves color. I'll tell you the very first time that I had the chance to walk into their home for a meal. And this goes back almost 16 years. So they were pastoring on, in, on, on, on Maui, the Kahului Church, but they were living in Lahaina because we had a parsonage there right next to the Lahaina Church. And so Pastor Rob Lloyd, who is the conference secretary, and I were over and doing some visiting. And of course, Juan and Judith, being the hosts and the graciousness of them, they invited us to come and eat. And I will never, ever, ever forget. We walked into that little parsonage, and all of a sudden, my, my senses were blitzed <laughs> with color that was like psychedelic. I, re I remember there was, some, there was a, a yellow and like an orange. And, and I told Judith, I said, Judith, I'm going to have to go outside and get my sunglasses to just to cut, to eat in here. The, the colors were just, and so when they left, the painter had to go over this multiple times to get back to the neutral white once again that the parsonages <laughs> usually have. 
So it was then I realized Judith just is a lover, a lover of color. Gracious, gracious gift of hospitality. And she's been so gracious to myself and to Sharon through all of these years. And I think finally what I'd like to say is, is that, you know, God counts our days and remembers our service. And I want you to remember that as well. This is just not for Pastor Juan and Judith. This is something for you to remember. God counts our days and remembers our service. I'm looking back at the young people back here with the uh, audio visual. God counts your days and remembers your service. The service that you're returning to him, even right here. It doesn't have to be a big thing, maybe like a leader in the church, like the gentlemen that are sitting up here on the platform. But just the testimonies that you were sharing of making phone calls, praying for somebody. You see, to whom much is given, the Bible says, much is required. And I can assure you that as Seventh-day Adventists, God has given us much, which means God wants us to return this back to him in faithful service. And God remembers our days, and he remembers our service. It doesn't have to be big. It can be even something small. But if God can count the hairs on our head, he remembers every little thing that we do for him in service. Everything. So remember that. So I know Pastor Juan and, <clears throat> and Judith, you've already been receiving some, some wonderful gifts. I have something for you, and this is on behalf of the Hawaii Conference. So what I'm going to share with you now is from the conference, but it is something that I specifically was looking for, and I went out and found it and purchased it on behalf of the conference, and I want to give it to you as a gift. Now, you know, normally when you give a gift, it's all wrapped and you just hand it to the individual and they're able to open it when, when they choose. This is a gift that I'm going to actually share and show to everybody here today because there's some rich symbolisms behind it that I think are very much attributed to who the two of you are. So what I went out and purchased is this beautiful bowl. Isn't that beautiful? But it's not just a wooden bowl. What I was looking for specifically was koa wood. Koa wood. There's some really rich symbolisms of koa that I think are symbolic of your lives and ministry to us. So there's three specifically I want to share with you. And the reason why I wanted to get koa and to give you this bowl is, is that when you do move back and are in your home and wherever you place this bowl, it will be a reminder to you from us here in Hawaii. The first thing that I think is very symbolic is, is that koa originally was just reserved for royalty, for the royal family. And to us, you are royalty. You need to understand that. So the koa represents royalty, and you are royal to us. The second thing I think that is very symbolic is, is that koa means warrior. It means warrior. And you have been faithful warriors for Christ in expanding his kingdom wherever God has placed you in his vineyard. Warrior, koa. And then I would say thirdly, the symbolism is, is that what makes koa so unique and special is, is that you can't find this anywhere else in the world. It is grown here in Hawaii and specifically mostly here on the big island. It's unique and special because you cannot find this or buy it anywhere else in the world. And what's symbolic is that you are unique and special. And there's nowhere else in the world we're going to ever find two people exactly like you ever. So from our hearts to yours, when you see this koa wood bowl, just remember how much you are loved and how much you're going to be missed by all of us. Tell, you want to take it with you now? Oh, okay. you ask my wife to come and pick it up? Or? There you go, honey. Please.
on the right hand side, now she's on the left hand side because I'm in the right now. <laughs> but wherever she stands is good. <laughs> and many times I've asked her to stand in front of me. Because she's a good helper. I couldn't have found a better mate to make my ministry as it is now. Twinkle, I remember in Maui. I came home, and there was a note in the table. And she said this, honey, the food is in the refrigerator. You can take it out and warm it up and eat it. I'll see you sometime tonight. There's a young lady who needs some counseling. I'm going to spend the night with her. That's my job. No. It's both of us. She's taken groups all the way down to Florida for prayer conferences. She's taken groups to California, Washington, D.C., women's ministries. And she's done a lot of traveling with ladies and young people likewise, doing a wonderful, great ministry. Thank you, honey. Thank you very much. And I tell her this in front of you. We've been together for 54 years already. We've given our lives to the Lord. I used to have three hernias. I have a little baby one growing up again. Four? Don't, don't remind me. I get home on the 13th. On the 17th, the doctor waiting for it with a knife and a fork. No, a knife and needle. <laughs> we all have um, the opportunity to visit our doctors and be able to care for ourselves too. We solicit your prayers, folks. We want you to pray for us, and we're going to sense that. Believe in prayer, trust in him, and don't ever move your eyes from him. Amen. Thank you for everything. Yes. Thank you. I don't think we need a sermon now. been so tough, so good, so good. I, for one, want to say mission accomplished. Even though my dream of having a gazebo over the baptistry on below, by the way, it's going to happen. <laughs> we talked to our treasurers this past, don't worry about it. We're going to put up something beautiful over that baptistry by the summer. It's okay. We die to sin. We bear our sins in the water. And we walk up and we are raised up in newness of life. Amen? I will just give you 10 minutes of my sermon. I'm going to be brief with you. Would that be okay? Heavenly Father, this is your time. Every minute has been your time. It's all about you, Lord. Not about Judith or I. We have many faults. We are frail. Ill at times. But you've been a 
You're being our salt. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, God. And you will continue being our salt as we present a few words in this of advice and counsel, Father, to lead me from this thought here. Thank you for both Kohala and Honokai. What wonderful people you gave me to look into and look after. Perhaps that's part of the past. Perhaps my eyesight wasn't straight. My words weren't kind enough. But Lord, I ask for forgiveness, and I ask forgiveness of this beautiful congregation. There's more to be done. Thank you, Father. a farewell for pastor, but this sermon is not going to be a farewell for, for it. It's going to stay here. So I'm asking that uh, when I show you some of these slides, will you remember them? And don't remember me. Remember what God has for you. So I'll quickly go over some of these slides, and I'll, I, I know we're going to do good. Thank you, Father. Is it the right button? Start from the beginning, and then help me out. Can you switch it over with the little button? Okay. All right. I guess we're okay here. Let's let's go to the next one. Is that the stuff I need? Okay. We're going to read from Colossians, which Marcia did already. Colossians three one and four. That serves well to be the heart of Adventism. And by the way, from you visitors who are here today, Adventism comes from the word Adventist. We're waiting for Jesus to come. If you came in, saw the picture of Christ coming, it's going to happen, folks. It's going to happen. And I can't say it any louder. So when you come every day to church, I want you to stand right there and look at that picture, and I want you to see yourself among the people waiting for Jesus. Is that a deal? Yes. Every time you come here, look at that picture. And I will, it will remind you what Adventism is all about, folks. And the seventh day reminds us of the God's beautiful commandments. The fact is that we know that the Sabbath is a day of rest. The day of the Sabbath is the day that God rested from all the work he and So this text I'm going to read to you today, we're going to look study together, is going to be something that's going to stay with you. Of course, I'll take it in my heart because every time I remember the sermon, and by the way, this sermon is not 3,000 years ago. I have many sermons in pieces of paper, yellow, eaten by whatever, but this is fresh. I preached it last Sabbath in Kohala, and I want to bring it to you. So let me see if we, we are there, there, Colossians 3. Three and four. For you died, and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus, in God. When Christ, who is our, when Christ, I think I missed, oh, let me go back. Uh, okay, let me go back, because there's another verse. Is that it? Verse one? Is that the first one? I, I'm missing, it's supposed to be one to four, and... Uh, Okay, there it is. If then you were raised with Christ Jesus, seek those things from which are above. For Christ Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. Where is Jesus? Sitting at the right hand of God. So set your mind on things above. Not on things 
from this earth. There's better things to look at, folks. Come on. Look at the ocean. Look at the sky. Look at the people around you. They all remind us of a powerful, loving God. And when he says, the Bible says, look beyond the sky, I, I hope that you, we understand it's a long ways up there, but Jesus can send an angel in one second be with you. And God's love can be with us. No matter how far away it is. Now, did I tell you that about me? Okay. Okay, I don't see my picture over here, but anyway, we, we, could, we could go. Okay, we'll go next one. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ Jesus in God. And when he appears, who is our life, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Did you see that this text has to do with Adventism? And I'm going to show you real quick now. All right? We find redemption, which is the cross. We find reconciliation, which is dying through Christ Jesus, or the death of Jesus. We find resurrection, eternity. We find baptism, surrender. We find sanctification, newness of life. And we also find the throne where Jesus stands with the Father as our high priest. Jesus is alive and active, waiting for us to come to him any time of the day. Any time of the day, he's there. The word glorification also means Christ Jesus' second coming. And I'm going to challenge you. Read those texts and see what else do you find that encircles what we believe in, the Seventh-day Adventist. And I'm sure you're going to find some more there. All right, so let me real quick go in here. You noticed that my title of the sermon was A Wonderful, Precious Journey. Come on, folks. You and I are in a journey. The ocean you see there will have one in heaven. It's an ocean like, like smooth, like a glass. And I believe if it's like a glass, I thought many times I've dreamed of walking on the waters. We're going to walk on the waters in heaven. Come on. Not the ocean we have in this world with tsunamis and hurricanes and you name it, all the destruction that's done. But a beautiful, beautiful sea of peace and love. And beauty. All that we need. But I want to tell you the beauty of Jesus and our Father. And we're going to meet the Holy Spirit. Come on, folks. We're going to meet the Holy Spirit. We talk about his spirit, but he is a, he is a deity, a being who has feelings and love like the Father and like the Son, Jesus Christ. So three things I want to, and I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to talk about the three that we just finished talking about. Number one, church, I've been talking about Jesus since I came here. I, I Perhaps you would have wanted me to talk about health and diet. Perhaps you would have wanted me to talk about the, the family and marriage. Perhaps you would have wanted me to talk about any other subject other than Jesus. But there's no other thing that, other than Jesus. It stops there. It starts with Jesus, and it stops there, too. One day I was preaching for the last seven months when I got to one church, and somebody came up to me and said, Pastor, why don't you preach about the prophecy? I've been doing that every day, every Sabbath I'm here. Well, how about the husbands and wives situation, marriage? I've been doing that, too. Well, when was that? Every time I come here, I talk about Jesus, and if Jesus can't do you what you want, nothing else is going to do it for you. I've been to marriage encounters, and I see people, and I've gone to several of those, and guess what? I see the same people come in. I said, where are the other people? Well, 
we're still struggling, Pastor. You still have been struggling. If you take Jesus as your partner in the home, you'll be okay. Jesus in your life and in your home. And you'll be the example of all these marriages happening in this world today. When we say focus in Jesus, what does that mean? And the text said it. Set your eyes upon things in heaven. And what do we have in heaven? We have a judge. We have a lawyer. We have the Holy Spirit. And we have the angels. Giving witnesses, being as witnesses and testimonies about you. And God is so willing to save us. He's provided so many angles and so many doors and so many gates open. There's no reason why we can get lost. There's no reason for that. And I'm going to say this very loud and clear. Seventh-day Adventists are not being Adventists to be lost or go to the torment of hell. Of course, that's a little time when everything's consumed. Because we have all the, the information we need. And God is so merciful. It's not a three and you're out kind of thing. It's every day we come to Jesus. Every day we come to Jesus. And I've always said this. There's no way that we can pass one day without being assured that my salvation is there. The fact is, folks, that God has made us to be soft-hearted when you were baptized. That stony heart is not stony anymore. The reason I know that is because you're here today. It's warm, living. It's tender, ready to receive whatever from the Lord. God is good. Number two, focus in faith. Everything we do, what has to do with Adventism and God, has to do with faith. We have a God that forgives us every single day, by the way. And you don't have to have a long, long prayer or read so many books of Ellen White to be forgiven. Those will help you. Prayers, long prayers, in your own home, in your closet. And Ellen White has given enough of materials and enough information that will follow through. And the Bible, come on. Excellent. Excellent reading for the meditation. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. It's so wonderful to learn and know. Focus and faith having to do with the faith of Jesus and the faith of in Jesus. Are you with me? Believe. Faith is very simple if you take it in these terms. My description of faith is trust God. Trust him. You can get your, your bank account and you can give it to him with the numbers and the figures and he will probably multiply those funds that you have. Spiritual funds, of course. When you focus in faith, you focus in Jesus. You wake up in the morning, you give your life to him before your feet touch the floor. Say, God, today I need you so terribly. Can't do it without you. Focus in the hope. The word hope, I'd like to demonstrate it to you, but I don't think I'll do that this morning. But just imagine when people in those days talked about hope, it was the coming of Christ Jesus. The hope is an expression that had to be sounded or said with joy. They would jump up and down. Yes, yes, Jesus is coming. Christ is coming, and again, we're going to see each other, and again, we're going to hug each other. No more pandemics, hello. No more masks, vaccinations, and tests. But we can hang out with Jesus today and begin living 
eternity as you have been living in eternity if you didn't know that. The moment you make yourself part of Jesus, you are being saved. I'm going to say this. I've said it so many times because it's in my heart, and I believe it, folks. Three of, my, three of my brothers were raised Adventists. They did their best. They read their Bibles, spirit of prophecy. They prayed. They loved the Lord. But the devil came in one day and said, hey, I want you to cross the fence. I got something better for you. And they did cross the fence, and there was greener pastures, according to Satan. I got better stuff to show you. And they lost the way. And my mom and my dad would pray and pray and pray for their children. We were nine of us. Not only my mom and dad, even Pastor Juan would pray with them. When they were in the hospital, when they're having serious problems with their health, when they were destitute, drunk, under the influence of alcohol, wanting to scold them, get them by the shoulders, and not allow them to understand that they were going in the wrong direction that they needed to get focused, be focused in Christ and focused on, on faith and focused on hope. And alcohol killed all three of them. But let me tell you this story. My first oldest brother, he's 27 years old. We went to the hospital. The nurses called me, dear son, he's not doing well, I told my dad. Bring the family over. My dad, my mom, and my sibling went to the hospital. Then he opened his eyes. He said, Dad, can you pray for me? What, was that real? Never had he said to anyone, pray for me. And now when he's losing his life, he said, Dad, pray for me. We took his hands, they were cold, bones. And my daddy prayed a prayer for healing. A prayer for healing. Because we were all holding on to him. And my dad said, amen. That body didn't move at all. Closed his eyes for prayer, and he died with his eyes closed. And one day, when he opens them up, he's going to see that same picture. Kind of like that. That's all he said, pray for me. I'm going to assure you, I will see him in heaven, and I'll give you the reason why. Number two, brother number two. We were coming to California. We had visited two weeks. Our family, after as soon as we landed, I got a phone call. Your brother Ray had just passed away. Thinking it was like about Monday, Sunday, the day before, I was with him and my wife. We took his hands and he said, Johnny, they call me Johnny, pray for me. Standing, my other brother was in bed dying. He was standing, dying. We took our hands and squeezed his hands, and I begged the Lord to have mercy on him. But it all started by these words, Johnny, pray for me. The next day when we flew, he died. I had to go back for the funeral. Brother number three, he was in the hospital bleeding from all the avenues of the body. I stood by his bed, and he said, Johnny, can you pray for me? Sure, little brother. He was my youngest brother. I took his hands, my wife on the other side, and we prayed. He 
you died a day later. Once upon a time, there was a thief on the cross, folks, dying. And another one, a thief of souls who grabbed the souls from the devil's hands and got them to himself. And then the one destitute. And the one on the right said, Jesus, pray for me. He said it in no way. Lord, remember me. In other words, pray for me when you come to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, I tell you, this moment, you will be with me in paradise. If I take that thief going to heaven after being a thief and whatever he was, and was assured of his salvation, my three brothers who said, Daddy, pray for me. Johnny, pray for me. Johnny, pray for me. I will see my brothers. I know I will see them. And then I can tell you of others who I sense that God is so merciful because their prayers were very sincere. They were hurting. They were dying. They were bleeding to death. And they had to get some help from someone, and it was my Father in heaven. I'm very hopeful of the second coming of Jesus, and I'm very hopeful that I would see all of those dear brothers who we love so much we played, we loved, we did so many things together on six of us. I want to just tell you today, hang on to the cross of Jesus. He gave his life for you and for your loved ones. And then he said, it is finished from the cross. And one day he will say, it is finished, Juan, and come and die. Joe, my older brother, Uncle Ray, we call him Uncle Ray, my brother, and Uncle Gilbert, my youngest one. And that doesn't exclude my mom and my dad and dear friends that we love so much. I want to see you in heaven. I want you to give me a Hawaiian hug in heaven. And because I'm going to be in the front of the line, I'll take you for a little tour. And I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. I'll introduce you to Jesus. Him who saved me. And use me, I've always said, just like this, a little bit. Because I haven't done nothing, folks. I've always said yes. And sometimes, Gordon Leo says, okay, Lord, you know. But he's so loving and kind. He doesn't want me to get lost, or you to be lost. You have the opportunity. So I want to leave my welfare sermon today with you. I'll take it in my heart, but I'm just going to stay here, folks, until Christ comes. Amen? I love you all. I love Kohala. And my heart stayed in Maui for many, many months until they released me. God bless you all.